that love was engendered through my proximity to the New York City watershed. See, I lived adjacent to about 1,200 acres of watershed, and, uh, and that was my backyard. And that's where I really developed the love of fishing and, and hiking and exploring in, in that watershed. So that had an impact on you growing up, obviously. It, it did. It did. Uh, by virtue of the fact that, you know, I, I was able to spend time there with my brothers and my sisters and, uh, and go on little uh, half day and day hikes in there. And again, fishing, catching frogs, turtles, and so on. Um, looking at the dragonflies, the butterflies, all the, the different animals in that, in, in that area. That was a, it was really an oasis in a sense, because, you know, you're near major highways and, and all that, but it was also uh, quite, quite a place to explore and, and quite a place to learn. And that really, really engendered again, my love of, of the wild, but in particular, local wildlife and, and local habitats and systems. You went on to Cornell. Yes. Yeah, I, I studied animal science and, uh, and ultimately, I, I don't know, I'm, I'm sure I speak for some of the folks on tonight that you, when you're 19, you think you know what you want to do for the rest of your life, but you may not be so sure. And so at one point I was determined to be a stockbroker and I'm, I'm glad I determined that that wasn't a course and a path for me. Uh, but I got bitten by the bug with, when it came to my bio classes, my animal science classes, and I graduated with a degree from the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences in Applied Economics and Business Management. So there was that duality of the natural world and, and the business world of working with humans. And I think, you know, anybody who goes into conservation in any form, they've got to have that not only ability, but desire to work with their fellow humans. That's, that's a really important thing. I, I mentioned that to the interns at the zoo all the time. You may love the animals, but you, you have to work with the people and that's important. Well, before we go, onto the next chapter of your career, were there any, was there a particular inflection point either as a child and or in college that really made you convinced that that's the path you wanted to take? Yes, yeah, there, there actually was a particular point and it, it was like, it was right in between. It was, um, it was the spring of my uh, junior year in high school, I guess it was, I was 16 and, uh, and a friend of mine uh, had turned me on to an organization known as Earthwatch. And Earthwatch, as many of you may know, is a citizen science-based uh, nonprofit. And uh, they, they connect uh, scientists in marine biology, archeology, span anthropology, whatever the discipline may be, with, with lay people. And as a high school student, I, I was able to, you know, the, the, the deal I struck with my folks was, if you give me permission to go, I'll do anything. And they said, well, that's really easy. You just have to raise every penny for it and you can go. So, so I did that, obviously, you know, I shoveled the, the driveway and worked for our neighbors and, you know, saved up for the course of about a year. And, I, and it was laughable. Now, it was $765, all inclusive. That was it. So it wasn't that much, but to a kid my age, that was a lot. And I, that was, that was a, an inflection point for me because that enabled me to get out into the field, to tag leatherback sea turtles, patrol Davis Beach and St. Croix, um, and work with, with marine biologists with, those, with that species and really help leatherbacks to get on better footing in the Caribbean through that one project, or at least have exposure to it. We, we were only one week within a multi-year project, but it gave me a really, a really um, a great lens through which to view conservation, and it was an aspiration point for me. What did you do after graduation? Yeah, so one of the other things that you know I was really passionate about and I still am passionate about is writing. And, and I was working for a publisher at the time and I, I really wanted to get into uh, wildlife conservation, probably more so. There was that sort of uh, struggle, you know, one or the other. And, uh, and I was able to um, eventually, through combination of uh, the volunteer work that I had accumulated, and the, the fledgling resume that I built at that time, I, I was able to uh, land a job at uh, Bergen County Zoo, which is an accredited zoo in New Jersey, in, in Paramus, New Jersey. And uh, that experience then led to um, me coming to Beardsley. At the time, believe it or not, I was living in Connecticut and commuting to New Jersey. So I was really happy not to make that commute anymore, but that, that wasn't the, that was just a byproduct. The, the real love was uh, when I went to Beardsley, I, the people were wonderful, the animals were wonderful, 
it was a very good setting and I was very fortunate to, to land that job. And you've been there how many years now? Uh, been there, um, let's see, uh, straight, I worked for a little period of time and then I, I came back to the zoo um, when the zoo went to society ownership, to private nonprofit ownership um, with support from the city of Bridgeport. And I came back in, it'll, it'll, this is my 21st year now. Mm -hmm. So it goes, it goes really quickly. You know, people say that, you know, how fast can 21 years go? Well, when no two days are alike and you love what you do and you have a dynamic workplace, you know, it can be stressful, sure, but time does go very quickly. And I think my colleagues in, at the zoo would agree with that very quickly. Yeah, time does go very quickly, but that's interesting because it is a dynamic workplace. So that, that probably makes it go even faster in some regards. It does, very fast. Interesting point. So uh, tell us about Trout in the Classroom. Sure. Uh, Trout in the Classroom is, is a program that's near and dear to my heart. And I, I know to, to other folks at the zoo as well and, and to folks in the zoo community. Um, a little over eight years ago, we had the opportunity to, um, to engage with students in Bridgeport in, in a way in which was um, very um, far reaching through um, establishing a, a regional or rather a local chapter of Trout in the Classroom. Trout in the Classroom is a national education and conservation program it's set in schools mostly, although there are a few non-school points, uh, the zoo being one of them, of course, um, that are home to these chapters, but th these can range from kindergarten classes to high school classes. And I believe there are also some, some college level classes, uh, college um, affiliations with these various chapters around the country. To give you an example of how broad this program is, there are roughly 100 chapters in the state of Connecticut. And what these, what these organizations, what these chapters do is they raise brown trout typically, sometimes rainbow trout, very rarely brook trout as in our case, and they raise them to um, a size where they head start them. So they give them a, a chance to, um, to grow in human care under the guidance of students, very, very significantly, student-led husbandry and uh, water chemistry and, and all, the, well, we'll talk about all the different aspects to it in a little bit, but it enables the students to provide this, this stewardship input. The, steward, the kids take real ownership of the project and they, they take care of these fish and they grow them. And then it, we can get them in the river at a certain point where their heads started. So that what that means for, for folks who may not be familiar, it's pretty intuitive, but um, we give them, we grow them to a point where they're, they're less likely to be picked off by those kingfishers and giant water bugs and all their sort of mid-level and lower level predators out there. So at, a, at about four to five inches in length, you can, you can get fish in the river and they can already bypass the, run the gauntlet on most of those predators. Mm. So the, the students are raising them from eggs to fingerlings, are they called? Well, depending upon the, the chapter, some, some chapters raise the fish from eggs or they raise them from fry or fingerling stage. We typically raise them from fry stage, which means they're roughly about an inch to an inch and a half at most. Uh, they're very, very light. They weigh just a few grams each. And, um, and uh, we raise them to about, um, uh, well, they still have their par markings on them, but to around the four uh, or five inch range. So a little larger than your typical fingerling. Mm -hmm. just beyond fingerling size. And where do you get them? We work in conjunction with the uh, Connecticut Department of Energy and Environmental Protection, the Fisheries Division, the Inland Fisheries Division. And they've been staunch partners of ours uh, on many other projects, but on this project in particular for more than eight years since its inception, we've been working with them. And without them, none of this would be possible. And there are other folks that are key stakeholders and, and key uh, conservation partners in this Trout in the Classroom chapter. Hmm. And how many would you get from Connecticut Deep? Well, it depends upon the year and it depends upon um, their allocation, but typically we will get anywhere between 40 and about 150 fish because we may get relatively larger or smaller fish in any given year. Um, but this year, this past year, we were, we raised our largest school of fish to date. We had about 150 fish that we were raising this year. So that's, that's quite a lot. What did you do after graduation? 
Yeah. So one of the other things that you know I was really passionate about, and I still am passionate about, is writing. And and I was working for a publisher at the time, and I I really wanted to get into uh, wildlife conservation, probably more so. There was that sort of uh, struggle, you know, one or the other, and uh, and I was able to um, eventually through combination of uh, the volunteer work that I had accumulated and the, the fledgling resume that I built at that time, I, I was able to uh, land a job at uh, Bergen County Zoo, which is an accredited zoo in New Jersey, in, in Paramus, New Jersey. And uh, that experience then led to um, me coming to Beardsley. At the time, believe it or not, I was living in Connecticut and commuting to New Jersey. So I was really happy not to make that commute anymore, but that that wasn't the, that was just a byproduct. The, the real love was uh, when I went to Beardsley, I, the people were wonderful. The animals were wonderful. It was a very good setting, and I was very fortunate to, to land that job. And you've been there how many years now? Uh, been there, um, let's see, uh, straight. I worked for a little period of time, and then I, I came back to the zoo um, when the zoo went to society ownership, to private nonprofit ownership. Um, with support from the city of Bridgeport. And I came back in, it, it, this is my 21st year now. Mm -hmm. So great. it goes it goes really quickly. You know, people say that, you know, how fast can 21 years go? Well, when no two days are alike and you love what you do and you have a dynamic workplace, you know, it can be stressful, sure, but time does go very quickly. And I think my colleagues in at the zoo would agree with that very quickly. Yeah, time does go very quickly, but that's interesting because it is a dynamic workplace. So that, that probably makes it go even faster in some regards. It does very fast. Interesting point. So uh, tell us about Trout in the Classroom. Sure. Uh, Trout in the Classroom is, is a program that's near and dear to my heart. And I, I know to, to other folks at the zoo as well and, and to folks in the zoo community, um, a little over eight years ago, we had the opportunity to um, to engage with students in Bridgeport in, in a way in which was um, very um, far reaching through um, establishing a, a regional or rather a local chapter of Trout in the Classroom. Trout in the Classroom is a national education and conservation program it's set in schools mostly, although there are a few non-school points, the zoo being one of them of course, um, that are home to these chapters, but uh, these can range from kindergarten classes to high school classes. And I believe there are also some, some college level classes, uh, college um, affiliations with these various chapters around the country. To give you an example of how broad this program is, there are roughly 100 chapters in the state of Connecticut. And what these, what these, organizations, what these chapters do is they raise brown trout typically, sometimes rainbow trout, very rarely brook trout as in our case, and they raise them to um, a size where they head start them. So they give them a, a chance to, um, to grow in human care under the guidance of students, very, very significantly, student-led husbandry and uh, water chemistry, and, and all the, well, we'll talk about all the different aspects to it in a little bit, but it enables the students to provide this, the stewardship input. The, steward, the kids take real ownership of the project and they, they take care of these fish and they grow them and then we can get them in the river at a certain point where their head started. So that what that means for, for folks who may not be familiar, it's pretty intuitive, but um, we give them, we grow them to a point where they're, they're less likely to be picked off by those kingfishers and giant water bugs and all their sort of mid-level and lower level predators out there. So at, a, at about four to five inches in length, you can, you can get fish in the river and they can already bypass the run the gauntlet on most of those predators. Hmm. So the, the students are raising them from eggs to fingerlings, are they called? Well, depending upon the, the chapter, some, some chapters raise the fish from eggs or they raise them from fry or fingerling stage. We typically raise them from fry stage, which means they're roughly about an inch to an inch and a half at most. Uh, they're very, very light. They weigh just a few grams each and um, and uh, we raise them to about, um, uh, well, they still have their par markings on them, but to around the four uh, or five inch range. So a little larger than your typical fingerling, mm -hmm. just beyond fingerling size. And where do you get them? 
We work in conjunction with the uh, Connecticut Department of Energy and Environmental Protection, the Fisheries Division, the Inland Fisheries Division. And they've been staunch partners of ours uh, on many other projects, but on this project in particular for more than eight years since its inception, we've been working with them. And without them, none of this would be possible. And there are other folks that are key stakeholders and, and key uh, conservation partners in this Trout in the Classroom chapter. Hmm. And how many would you get from Connecticut Deep? Well, it depends upon the year and it depends upon um, their allocation, but typically we will get anywhere between 40 and about 150 fish because we may get relatively larger or smaller fish in any given year. Um, but this year, this past year, we were, we raised our largest school of fish to date. We had about 150 fish that we were raising this year. So that's, that's quite a lot. In this slide, we see uh, some of our students uh, getting weights on the fish. And you may say, well, how is that possible? Well, what we do is we weigh the fish in the water and then we, we remove the fish from the water and then we weigh the water in the container and we, we subtract the difference there. Um, but our students, they, they learn early on that it's very important to get data from these individual fish and from the school in general. So we can, when we have that data, then we can, we can study them in greater detail with more accuracy and with a scientific fidelity. So we're, we're teaching them really uh, the A's, B's and C's of, of husbandry when it comes to the fish. And I wanna give a shout out to and, and great credit to uh, one of my colleagues, Jen. Uh, Jen does an incredible job on this program. Uh, she's been with it for a number of years already. And she not only introduces the kids to many of whom have never been acquainted with the river, the Paquanic River before they start the program, but not only the river and the ecosystem in, in general, but to these fish and, and she acquaints them with careers available to them beyond high school and college. So Jen is, uh, is doing an incredible job with the students and it's a really a very well received program. Uh, there are some, some of the students preparing for a macro and looks like actually they're taking a break from the macro invertebrate study they're doing there. Macro invertebrates are big animals without backbones. So we're talking about, um, you know, um, aquatic insects largely, but also maybe some crayfish and uh, worms that are found um, in the, in the uh, river, in the Pequannock River. The Pequannock is right behind them. This is a river that is roughly 20 to 25 miles in length and flows through Bridgeport, Connecticut's largest city. Flows out into Long Island Sound, which is a protected arm off of the Atlantic Ocean for those folks who may be dialing in from, from far afield. And here the students are actually going through some of the, um, some of the, the findings of their, their latest haul or scoop there in the river. And they're going through and they're probably looking at uh, some fingernail clams some segmented worms uh, and, uh, and perhaps even a, a mussel or two or some, uh, some crayfish as well as some stoneflies or caddisflies. Here we have one of our, um, one of our trays, one of our macro invert trays that we use for easy analysis. All of the animals are, are readily visible with a, with a nice bright white background in broad daylight. It's easier to see them. And we also have, not visible in this slide, but we also have little handheld magnifying glasses so they can make positive IDs. We have a key that Jen and the other um, staff or volunteers on a given day will use to, to uh, analyze the, the findings on a particular day within the river. And by looking at the macroinvertebrate profile in the river at a certain time of year, we get a, a snapshot as to the health of the river. And that helps us to make the determination as to the forage uh, available to the fish and the likelihood of, of their well-being. So the, the long story short is that we're finding good healthy biomass on these macro invertebrate surveys and that bodes well for the river and bodes well for the trout and for everybody. Again one of our students making a quick haul there and I, I don't know if she's regretting it there but white pants with that mud, yeah, that's the, we, we believe getting in there getting a little messy. We roll up our sleeves, we, we get a little messy and that's the only way to do conservation. So, but it's fun, a lot of fun. These are good students that are quite serious. Is that correct? They are, they are, yeah. They, they, these are very focused students. We began working on this program with, um, we had the, the blessing of our zoo administration, um, 
both uh, Greg and Donna, our director and deputy director, were, were fully behind it. Our board was behind it. And it enabled us to, um, when you have that kind of institutional support, you can talk to community stakeholders with confidence. And one of those stakeholders was actually somebody who was familiar with our programming, which was uh, one of the board members on an organization known as the SEC, the Science Education Center of Greenwich. And uh, both Pat and her colleague, Lizette, who served on the board there, were familiar with our programming. And uh, one of their family members had been uh, in one of our youth programs, and they were very confident in our ability to connect with, with students. And that confidence led to a conversation. That conversation led to the eventual support through seed monies for the program. And I'm happy to say that not only did SEC support the program from day one, but also the National Fish and Wildlife Federation, the city of Bridgeport, Aquatic River Initiative. We had many, many stakeholders, Connecticut Deep, of course, the Department of Energy and Environmental Protection, our volunteers, the whole zoo community. So this program has been embraced from day one. And what it led to was a small cohort of students. We have 16 students in the program. We've had calls for enlarging the program, expanding it to 50 or 100 or more. And we have resisted those calls. I have personally, because I want to keep the, the sessions, the classes Socratic in nature. We want to keep it small. We want to keep the cohort small so we can dive deeply into these, these lesson plans. And, and it's worked out great with Jen at the helm. Uh, the students have to maintain an A average. They have to be recommended for the program by their, their teachers, by their science teachers and or their principal. And they have to write an essay as to why they want to enter into the program. And the seventh and eighth graders, they're very focused, uh, young ladies and gentlemen. And when it comes to the dynamic there, um, from day one, the SEC worked with us to support this program for young ladies in science in particular. So our ratio is 75% young ladies in science in the program. Jim, they come from two particular schools in Bridgeport? They do, Park City Prep and Bridge Academy. Does that mean that they go year over year uh, or do they, they kind of uh, graduate, if you will, and then someone else can come in and join the program? How does that work? Thank you for that, that uh, mention because it's, it's a really neat dynamic. The, the seventh and eighth graders we, we have them work together such that there's the eighth graders mentor the seventh graders coming in and we have pretty strong um, uh, continuity from one year to the next. In other words, we, we lose very few seventh graders to academic ineligibility. Um, they go right up to the eighth grade. They're, they're ver very enthused about the program. They love it. They come back. And then the next year, they're the ones who, um, you know, put their armor on the seventh graders, so to speak, and show them the, the way of the, the trout, you know, and it's, uh, they show them how, how we do everything. Certainly, Jen is at the helm, but it really helps to have those those eighth graders in that role because they're, they take it to heart. They're really serious about it. And, and when you're a seventh grader, anybody over the age of 18 is, is old. And when you're a seventh grader, the eighth graders are rock stars and as they should be. Mm -hmm. I, I imagine some of them are disappointed when they finish their eighth grade because then they're no longer involved with that program. Uh, some of them, you know, they've expressed this to us at times. They've said, I'm really bummed. I'm not going to be able to continue. But the good news is, we tell them, hey, you know, we have a lot of different programs for them and there's no need to leave the zoo community. So when they graduate from Trout in the Classroom, some of our students from TIC have gone right into another program we have, an award-winning program called the Conservation Discovery Corps. And this is a program for high school students to engage in conservation science and education. It's a really robust program. Uh, we've got about 50 students in there on average from year to year. Um, and so the students definitely have they have a, a path that they can take if they choose. And they can do that from ninth grade through 12th grade if they want, right? That's correct. Yeah. That's correct. And, and I would say that, you know, we don't, we don't just talk about the, the very practical benefits of this, but some of those benefits include public speaking ability, uh, socialization with, with your peers, which is certainly, you know, the kids, they're really a cohesive bunch, but frankly, from, a college standpoint or from a, a workplace standpoint, when, when colleges and potential in, in employers, prospective employers see that these, these students have public speaking skills, research skills, education on, on their resume at, at the ages of 16, 17, and 18, it's a, it's a really strong testimony to their, their talent and their, their drive. All of the trout that you raise are released into the Pequannock River, is that correct? 
nearly all of our trout are released into the Pequannock. Uh, from year to year, we, we may have some that, uh, what we do is we work with the, the tank dynamics, the school dynamics, in that we may have a, a year when we have fish that are, we have a relatively larger um, start, uh, starting point with relatively larger fish. So if we have that, we may, we may release some fish earlier, staggered, in a staggered release into the park, into the Pequannock River, but we try to release them all at one time. We do this because the carrying capacity of the tank is only so great, and we, we fastidiously monitor the ammonia levels and the water chemistry uh, parameters in the tank to make sure that, that the fish are, are healthy. And you know, if you have, um, if you have a downturn in the tank system, it can affect all the fish very rapidly. So we have to be very careful about that. Yeah. Would, would you want to be raising more if you had the facility or like another tank even, or, or would you prefer to keep it the way it is? Well, we do have the capacity. We do have a, a backup tank with a chiller. It's important that you have a chiller for your tank because these are brook trout and they're, they're cold water loving species. And we can talk about that as it relates to the conservation of the river, of course, but um, we do have a backup tank for that purpose. We do use it sparingly. The one thing that we've been very careful about doing is we, we want to make sure we could get into more of a, a volume approach, I, I suppose, but like the, the student cohort, we've, we felt our philosophy has been that we want to have a representative population that we can work with and eventually release. The goal has never been to, to uh, look at sheer numbers in the program. And, mm -hmm. The, the population itself is considered, um, it's not considered a, um, an essential population by, by the Department of Energy and Environmental Protection. What I mean by that is they're not putting tremendous resources behind getting the fish in the river. Um, they're doing that for other species, but they've given us the, frankly, the, uh, the, the good, good fortune to work with the brook trout. We're the only chapter in the state um, who works with the brook trout, and that's because of the, the expertise that our staff and, and volunteers possess in this regard. So with that said, um, we're looking to, to do what we can to, to give the students an opportunity to work with a, a native species that was extirpated or, or it made regionally extinct, locally extinct within the Pequannock system. So our students are actually bringing a, an animal species back that was extinct in this river system. That's the real benefit not the sheer numbers. The brook trout could, could have been existing in, in other Connecticut rivers, but in the Pequannock, they were essentially extinct? That's correct. There are brook trout populations in other rivers in Connecticut. However, if you look at the, the population map, um, almost all the coastline rivers, there are very few brook trout. They're almost all absent brook trout from these coastline rivers. They're, they're more prevalent higher up, so to speak, in the foothills of the Appalachians, in, in the, the northern parts of the state, in less traveled parts of the state that aren't impacted by the introduction of rainbow and brown trout as much. I think that's a good segue for you to tell us more about, specifically about the brook trout. Can you do that? Uh, there are species that they are emblematic of, of our, our, um, our legacy in Connecticut, our, our, our wild legacy in Connecticut. And they were a native species that was here um, when the first uh, Europeans arrived in Connecticut and they were fished for thousands of years by the Native Americans. Uh, the, the brook trout is actually not a trout. It's, it's sort of a misnomer. The brook trout is, is a char and a char is, is like the great, great granddaddy of all trout and salmon. They're the progenitor of all these modern species that we know. And they're, the brook trout were left over um, really in, in remnant populations from the receding of the, uh, the great ice sheets in North America. And so we'd find them in, in streams that were typically spring fed, uh, streams that were cold, clean, uh, free of pollutants in, in modern times. They're very environmentally sensitive. And, uh, and with the advent of, of industrialization, we see that the brook trout habitat was compromised and eventually in some areas destroyed. And the fish became less of a fixture on the landscape. And when we add the the introduction of brown trout and rainbow trout, non-native species, which are really popular with anglers, the brook trout lost out. They're, they don't grow as, as big, they don't grow as fast. Um, they don't compete as well with those introduced species, but they are our native salmon. They are our native uh, species here in Connecticut. And 
And I think we have uh, both an opportunity and a responsibility to bring them back in any way we can. We will see brook trout and other rivers, typically in, in relatively modest numbers, because again, they're competing with, um, there's a, a recreational uh, industry and a recreational angling. People will, they want to catch trout. They want to catch fish and they want to catch trout in particular. And rainbow and brown trout uh, grow larger and faster, very economical to raise. So those are the predominant species that are stocked. They're stocked in greater numbers than brook trout. Uh, so you will find them in some of these other local rivers and streams in particular. Typically, you'll find them in headwaters. Typically, you'll find them, um, they'll be a fraction of the size of their, their bigger cousins. And, uh, and you have to be very selective as to where you go. You almost have to know where to find them. Um, I will say there are a few populations of native brook trout right here in, in Fairfield County. Uh, one of them is in Deep Brook in Newtown, which flows into the Pudatuck which eventually flows into the Housatonic. That is a native strain. It's been an unadulterated native strain for, for long, long before the, the uh, European set, settlement of the uh, New England colonies. So uh, there are native brook trout that are, that are um, native to particular streams in Fairfield County that are still here with us, but very few. I would just say, a lot of people ask us, what's the real difference between uh, brook trout and, and other trout or char and trout. And the basic difference is all trout in the world have a lighter background. This is something we can all observe. You know, you don't have to be a fisheries biologist to observe this. All trout in the world have a lighter background with dark spotting or speckling. And brook trout have a dark background with lighter spotting or speckling. And they're also unique in that the patterns on the back, the dorsal side of the animal, the top by the, by the dorsal fin, have these little worm-like markings, they're called vermiculations, and that means worm-like marking. They're very pretty, but it helps to camouflage the fish when seen from above with the swirling of water and light. So they're very well camouflaged in their habitat. The other fish, what, what typically happens with, with um, our native trout and salmon, as they spawn, they, well, I should say the trout in particular, they acquire um, vibrant colors, but the brook trout is, is probably the most flashy or the most god not gaudy that's not a good word they're mm -hmm. dignified fish we don't want to call them gaudy uh but uh the most eye-catching says after eight years of work any ideas on how many brook trout population numbers have been established in the state how many trout trout brook populations and numbers have been established in the state well i'll, I'll answer that to the best of our ability it's it's really challenging to look at sheer numbers i can tell you roughly how many fish have been released in that time, we probably released on the order of 500 trout in the Aquatic River over that time period. And, uh, and that's, that's actually a conservative number. It's probably a little higher than that. We do know that through, um, through uh, fishing surveys that are carried on by the Connecticut Department of Energy and Environmental Protection, that these fish are not only returning, but they are spawning. So they are overwintering, they are surviving. We know from one image we had, uh, shared with us today that uh, these fish are, you know, they're not only surviving and overwintering, they're growing, they're getting pretty big. Uh, it's not unusual to see these fish come back in the 10 or 12 inch range or much larger. We actually have from about three years ago, we have footage, a still image from the camera that the Department of Energy and Environmental Protection runs of a brook trout that had made it over the fishway down along the Quantic River, out into Long Island Sound, had made the return trip back. And that fish was probably on the order of 18 inches, 17 or 18 inches, a big sea run brook trout, if you will. We know it was one of our fish because uh, the brook trout was extirpated or completely wiped out in the Quantic for roughly, or conservatively, 100 years or more, based on the industrialization of the river. And, and it's really important to mention too that our students, our staff, our volunteers in particular, they are going out there on certain days and, and birthdays in the past and on certain days, um, International Migratory Fish Day, for example. And they have planted, along with our horticultural staff, more than 2,000 trees and shrubs and other plants along the banks of the river. What that does is it provides shade and, and cover for these fish along the banks. It cools down the surface temperature of the river and it, it restores the habitat to its former level. But in, in short answer to Ashley, Ashley, at least 500 or more fish, and we don't have a sure number as to how many are surviving and overwintering. 
but we can tell you anecdotally that these fish are uh, are being caught and released. Uh, many of them, some if the, if the angler chooses to keep them, they may keep them, uh, but many are caught and released and they are uh, actually making it over the spillway in Long Island Sound. What I mean by overwintering is just that we're releasing them in, in say, typically in, in October or early November each year. And when, we're, when I'm saying they're overwintering, they are surviving the rigors of, of the winter, which means um, relatively, um, relatively suppressed uh, food available to them, relatively suppressed forage. Um, and they're also surviving the, uh, the predators that survive out there on the Paquanic River, which include in recent years, not only the osprey in the spring in particular and the bald eagle, but the North American river otter. And river otters have a high metabolism. They're hunting that river. We've seen them in that, in that river. We've seen them on the fish camera. We've seen them on, on the great lawn down by the water. We know that they're there. They're actively hunting. So they are surviving that gauntlet of larger predators. Even though we give them a head start, they still have to contend with those big predators. And when they do go into the sound, they, they don't go, they don't leave the area They're in the sound and they, they may come back into the river at some point. Yeah, typically what we find with brook trout, unlike say Atlantic salmon or steelhead, which is a sea run version of the rainbow trout, brook trout will go out into estuary areas and areas like Long Island Sound, maybe the neighboring areas of the Atlantic Ocean, but near, near shore, in near shore waters, not far out to sea. But even so, they're still, they're, they're hitting this all you can eat buffet with all that great biomass out there in these, in these brackish and saltwater ecosystems, and they're gaining, they're gaining size, they're gaining, they're gaining that mass, and they're coming back as essentially unrecognizable fish. They're much larger, and they've got a silvery hue to them. Jim, we have uh, another question here. Uh, three questions, actually, in one. What was the native range of brook trout? Okay. Uh, was it all over North America? And what is their current range? It's a really good question. Uh, the brook trout's range in North America extended, essentially, if, if you look at maps of where the ice sheets covered North America and then receded, if you look at the eastern half, the, the, the Mississippi, really the Ohio drainage east to the Atlantic, in particular the northeastern U.S., that would be their prime area. Um, if you look, the brook trout can be found in the mountains along the Appalachians down into South Carolina. And uh, there are some small populations in South Carolina, North Carolina, but they hug the spine of the Appalachian Mountains coming all the way up through, um, up into New England, Pennsylvania, certainly and then up into Northeastern Canada, and they range up into the drainages of uh, Labrador, Quebec certainly, and, and up into uh, even the Hudson River, Hudson Bay drainages. The Canadian brook trout grow, grow far larger uh, than the, the trout in this part of their range, in this more Southern climes. But these are, but if you look, it's essentially the highlands of Eastern North America on into the Atlantic coast drainage from the mid-Atlantic on in north into the North New England uh, region. Okay, very interesting. Uh, another question, Jim, how do they fit into a natural ecosystem for predators? And are they forced out by competitors like rainbow and brown trout or other, other species? Well, they're, they're uniquely designed by mother nature to live in these in, in typically uh, small spring fed watersheds. Um, they, they're not a fish of big water, of open water, like the Atlantic salmon. So they would do far better in, in some of these tributaries of the streams, not that they won't make the migration down into the rivers and into the sound, in our case, in Connecticut. But these are fish of, of springs and small streams, headwater streams. And that's where we see them nowadays. And, and I think I missed part B on that question or one of the aspects of the previous question. And their range now is quite discontinuous. There are some great resources out there uh, put out by Trout Unlimited in particular uh, to look at the, that have um, range maps by, by state and even by county. Uh, but they do compete well in those small headwater streams because uh, they can live in tiny pockets of water as long as the water is cold, typically 58 degrees or cooler, and uh, spring fed, as I mentioned, and uh, free of relatively free of pollutants. They do better in those systems than brook, than uh, rather than brown trout and rainbow trout, or than Atlantic salmon. And even when they live in the same stream, they separate by habitat preference. For example, 
the, the zoo staff, the volunteers and, and the staff of the zoo, they stock certain rivers on, on the west branch of the Farmington here in Connecticut for Atlantic salmon. And when we're out there stocking in the field, you'll notice very, very clearly that the, the trout, the, uh, the salmon live in the, in the fast water and the trout live in the pools. So um, the, the larger species, the rainbow and brown, will live in those deeper pools. Um, brook trout will often thrive in what we call pocket water. Literally, you can have a 10 inch brook trout living in a small section of stream that might be the size of a microwave oven in volume. As long as it has access to the, the current bringing the food to the trout, they can stake out that little area. That's fascinating. Adapting to the uh, environment. That doesn't mean they'll stay there their whole lives. It just means that they will, they will stake out the prime territory and they'll select based upon their strength. They save their energy by laying up in that pocket water. If you will, if you go to, um, I'm trying to think of a good example of a stream. Uh, Sandy Brook and Riverton I mentioned before would be a good example, especially higher up in, in, the, in the higher reaches of the stream, the headwaters. There might be some pools in those, in those areas that will not only hold brook trout, but they hold brook trout in great number. Uh, and what you'll see is the larger, more dominant fish will stick out the prime territory, even within a pool. There may be a significant boulder that, that breaks the force of the stream the stream flows around the boulder, it's prime real estate. It's prime real estate for that fish to stake out because the current is going to bring it food and it's going to be uh, shaded. It's going to be down lower. So it's gonna be cooler in, this, in those hot July and, and August weeks in July and August where it's 95 degrees. So that's prime real estate for the brook trout. And you'll see the larger fish definitely stake out those holes and the smaller fish will be relegated to um, closer, um, uh, smaller air, um, smaller hiding spaces or hiding places near the surface and near the uh, near the banks and those are the areas where they're more likely to come into contact with herons and mink and other animals that would like to make a meal out of them so including those larger brook trout if they venture down brook trout are cannibalistic mm. so well they, they do run the risk of being eaten by their larger cousins um, we thank you once again for this opportunity because it's Earth Day, and Earth Day, everybody thinks about conservation, certainly, or we're reminded about conservation, which is a year-round pursuit. But on this day in particular, the one thing in this day and age that most people are experiencing is the backyard aspect of conservation. And that, that's so important to bear in mind at this time and at all times. People want to preserve animals. They want to help koalas in Australia, and they want to help uh, animals in, in Africa and around the world, which is a wonderful thing. We don't want to diminish that. I would also add, though, that there are so many species that, that deserve our, our full attention and protection right here in New England and Connecticut. The zoo through our conservation um, programs and, and our conservation fund, we protect uh, species like chimney swifts and Atlantic salmon. Again, not necessarily the most glamorous species in the world, but it's nevertheless very important species. And there's so much great work that people can do in the form of backyard conservation. In theory, if everybody in the world protected their own backyard, we'd have the whole planet covered. And, uh, and that's what we're looking to do is engender that stewardship right in our own backyard. And that's why we're, we're very fortunate to have the community we do at the zoo. Our volunteers are second to none. Our staff is amazing. And uh, they really care about these animals and they, they make a difference on an individual basis. Great, Jim. Well, thank you so much for your really interesting words tonight. Uh, it was really uh, very, very enjoyable. And uh, what a great program. Uh, I forgot to mention that uh, Jim is uh, on our advisory council at Future Frogmen. And Future Frogmen is, is hosting this conversation tonight. And uh, we'd love it if you'd visit our website and uh, please consider signing up uh, on our email list. Uh, you can reach me there. You can reach out to me if you like. Uh, my contact information is there or just go to info at futurefrogmen.org. Uh, we're a nonprofit, and uh, if you sign up, you'll be on our list to hear about our other events, our other news, and we do these conversations uh, pretty regularly, so there may be other topics that would be of interest to you. And Jim, I'm sure we'll have you back, and we'll talk about the Atlantic salmon and, and some other things. So uh, thank you, Jim, again, and uh, thank you, audience, for joining us tonight.
Sounds great, Richard. Thanks so much. Happy Earth Day. <laughs> Happy Earth Day. Very good. Happy Earth Day, everybody. Thanks for watching. For more information, visit our website at www.futurefrogman.org.